Uh, so welcome back to our study of uh, Ruth and Esther, God's Chosen. Lord willing, we will be in chapter 4 next week, and that will conclude the book of Esther. And then we're going to go into the book of, I mean, that will conclude the book of Ruth. I sometimes get ahead of myself. And, and then we're actually going to take a week break in there. And, and just to, to be honest, it's personally selfish because our grandkids are coming to town. So we're going to take some days off and we're just going to go and spoil grandkids and have a great time with them and hopefully uh, pour a little of ourselves into them, you know? And so uh, we're going to invest in grandkids for a week. And so uh, next week we'll be here for Ruth chapter four. The week following is a week break. And then two weeks, uh, anyway, on October 11th, we will return for the first of uh, Esther, chapter 1. We're looking at the pride of Persia, and the Persian Empire was huge and uh, quite something to look at. Anyway, any rate, so we're in God's chosen, and we've been looking at the down and out or the up and out. Either way, uh, those who love God who are called according to his purpose, uh, that's us, that he works all things together. So everything in our life is working together for his purpose in our lives. And so uh, we, we get to know him and his purposes is a good thing. And so we're learning some of that as we get into Ruth. Uh, in chapter 2, Ruth was recognizing God's grace for her. She had made the decision and, and uh, committed to following uh, Naomi and to her people and to her God and would uh, so she came to Bethlehem and it was at the right time for uh, harvesting grain. Pastor Charlie got this photo of Ruth and Naomi. Now, at any rate, but uh, it, it uh, if you look in the upper right corner under the word grain, you'll see there are tires up there. <laughs> kind of gives it away. But this really was taken outside of Bethlehem on one of Pastor Charlie's tours when he was uh, in Bethlehem, and he caught these two women out there uh, harvesting grain uh, in probably a small family patch, but it was kind of interesting to see that, and uh, so I appreciated Charlie passing that on. And uh, it says uh, in, in chapter 2, so she, that is Ruth, kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of barley and then the wheat harvest, so several weeks of barley and then weeks of uh, wheat. And she lived with her mother-in-law for so those uh, many weeks or months that she was living with her mother-in-law and gleaning. And you remember that uh, Boaz had told his servants, pull out some of the good stuff for her and don't mind if she gets among the sheaves. And, and so he was really taking good care of her. And so she was gleaning and, and being blessed by this. And in God's favor then, she was faithfully, patiently waiting for the fulfillment. What's God doing in my life? Have you ever wondered why you were waiting? Lord, what are you doing? I mean, what is the, the big... Where are we going with this? I don't understand this place, Lord. What am I doing here? And, and so maybe Ruth thought that, but she is in a place of waiting and uh, for the fulfillment of God's purpose. There's a wonderful promise in the Psalms and uh, reads this way in the ESV. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Uh, in the New American Standard, it reads... Uh, the Lord will accomplish that which concerns me. And, uh, and then it goes on and it says, your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. The word steadfast love is one word in the Hebrew, which is the word hesed, which in Ruth, it's often translated kindness. We saw it in chapter 2. We'll see it again in chapter 3 as we're looking at it, that it uses that word, which normally refers to the faithful covenant love that is expressed perfectly in the Lord and in other people as well at times, but usually it focuses on the Lord. And it's a wonderful promise that the Lord 
will fulfill, he's going to accomplish uh, his purpose for us. As we get into Ruth chapter 3 then, we're talking about a vulnerable faith in God. A vulnerable faith is faith when you believe that God has led you to do something and you feel like you're kind of left out there hanging. And if God doesn't come through, you're not sure what's going to happen with this thing. But you feel like the Lord led you here and you're following. And so that's kind of the way Ruth is going. And it is also a love story for you ladies, okay? So (laughs) then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, my daughter, should I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? See, he is winning winning barley tonight at the threshing floor. Should I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? And, and it doesn't mean you're working too hard. I want you to take a break. She is saying, shouldn't I seek a good husband for you? I need to find you a good man, a husband and a home. Shouldn't we find you a good husband? She used that same meaning back in chapter one when she was encouraging the girls to go back to their own mothers. And she said, the Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. And you know, the Lord give you other husbands, go back to your moms and uh, the Lord provide rest for you. But Ruth has stuck with Naomi and Naomi feels that responsibility as the mom to be the matchmaker, right? Right. And so that's what she's thinking. She might bring someone wonderful, someone interesting, and well off, important. Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. Find that's someone. Ruth. No. <laughs> no, that'd be Naomi. <laughs> matchmaker, matchmaker, look through your book and make me a perfect match. So, (laughs) if you didn't recognize it, that's from Fiddler on the Roof, and uh, one of the famous scenes, and uh, so that's kind of Ruth. She's the mother, I mean, excuse me, Naomi. I keep, boy, it's a day for names, isn't it? Naomi, the mother-in-law, who is uh, stepping in to help find a a good spouse, a a good husband for her daughter-in-law, Ruth. And so uh, she has got one picked out, obviously. She says, you know, Boaz. Have you thought about Boaz, you know? You've been hanging out with his young women, and he's treated you pretty good. By the way, he's winnowing barley tonight down at the threshing floor. Earlier in the end of chapter 2, Naomi had said to Ruth, may he be blessed by the Lord. That is, may... Boaz, be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. The man is a close relative of ours and one of our redeemers. So in the end of chapter 2, she recognized that God was working and that Boaz may have been God's answer. Now, it's been a couple months, and she's been watching, and she comes back to this again, and she says, Have you thought about Boaz? And uh, he's down winnowing barley tonight. Now, it was good times had returned to Bethlehem. Threshing was a time of hard work, but the mood was one of laughter and joy and feasting. Why might that be? Because they had had a time of famine that had lasted for some years. And now it was a time when there was good harvest again. 
and they had come back to Bethlehem, and, and it was a time of rejoicing with bringing in the harvest. And so godly Israelites like Boaz would have been celebrating the goodness of God, definitely. And so uh, that's what was going on. And by the way, Pastor Charlie had this photo as well, which was, I thought, wow, that's excellent. This is modern day outside Bethlehem. And it is, it can't be that different from 3,000 years ago, over 3,000 years ago when Ruth was there. But there is this uh, exposed rock plot of land and they're using that where they are winnowing out the grain. They would uh, separate it with uh, wheels of a cart or an animal walking over it. And then they would take it and they would throw it up in the air. And the wind would blow off the chaff and the grain. So you can see he's getting a good pile of grain in front of that guy in the dark cloak. And the chaff is blowing here to the front of the slide. So that uh, it's kind of a, a neat picture there, and, and I'm just impressed. Uh, the guy on the right has got, they're in the middle, has got, got modern pants on, but the other gentlemen are dressed very much like they would have uh, back in the day. So uh, the process may not have changed much in some areas back there in Israel. And so this is where they were winning the grain out, and he caught that beautiful photo just outside of Bethlehem. And so she is saying, hey, he's out there winnowing barley tonight. Wash, therefore, anoint yourself, put on your cloak, go down to the threshing floor. Do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. So, uh, you know, wash, anoint yourself, uh, put on your cloak. Uh, it's an outer garment kind of a covering thing, and, and they would sometimes use that as a coat, or I mean, excuse me, as a blanket at night. And so that was their outer cloak, and she says, go down to the threshing floor, but don't approach him in public while the other men are around and, and they're celebrating or whatever. Wait till he's alone privately later. And then she has more instructions. By the way, the Western mindset reads this, and we read into it all kinds of sexual implications that she's setting him up for a seductive encounter. And that is not what is going on. That is our Western mindset at work. So don't let it throw you. We'll be kind of explaining it as we go through the process. But that's not what Naomi is suggesting. And so she's saying, go down there and uh, wait until he's uh, finished eating and drinking with the guys. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go, uncover his feet, and lie down there at his feet, and he will tell you what to do. You may have to wait a bit, but... And she replied, all that you say, I will do. And I would have thought... You want me to what? You know, <laughs> and, and Ruth just says, okay, she's going to do this. So she went down to the threshing floor. She did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Now, the reason he was lying at the end of the heap of grain was that while they were beating it out and they had these piles of grain that had built up during the day, and before they had time to take them to some secure location, they actually slept out there on the threshing floor to guard their grain, their, their produce, what they'd worked for. And so that's what he's out there. He's actually sleeping out there on the grain. You can imagine how comfortable that rock would have been to sleep on. But uh, he's out there by his uh, grain and going to sleep. And she comes softly and uncovers his feet and lays down. Lying at Boaz's feet signified her submission, the very significant that she was lying under his feet, a desire to be brought under his care and provision, protection. It was a proposal of marriage. It was a humbling, vulnerable position. 
What if he had other plans? He could say no. What if she did this and he mocked or insulted her proposal? What? You're a servant. I'm a landowner. You're a Moabite. You're a widow. What do I want with you? Who do you think you are? You foreign upstart. I mean, there's all kinds of things your mind would build up in your mind for Ruth. She would probably have these thoughts and and wonder, even though Boaz has been so kind to her and, and so nice and hasn't treated her badly at all, and yet your mind, or what if under the influence in the evening and the dark and the aloneness, he tried to take advantage of her? She was in a very vulnerable position, wasn't she? She was obeying her mother-in-law. She was following where the Lord had seemed to lead and yet would have been a very scary position to be in and a hard thing to do being out there. And so she goes and uncovers his feet, leaves his feet open, so he's going to get cold feet after a while. Uh, One of the commentators, it was funny, and I I almost brought it, but it would have taken probably half an hour to read. He just really got into telling stories about proposals and how people do them and how he had cold feet. He spent half a chapter talking about how he proposed to his wife. But so the cold feet brings up a lot of things you can play off of, but I won't. At any rate, so uncovers his feet. She's laying at his feet. A vulnerable faith. Now we come to Boaz's loving response. So at midnight, something startles Boaz, and he wakes up, rolls over, and behold, there's a woman laying at his feet. You imagine. And he said, who are you? (laughs) And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant. For you are a redeemer. Wearsby threw in some humor as well. He says, Adam went to sleep and woke up to discover he'd been through surgery and was now a married man. Jacob woke up to discover that he was married to the wrong woman. Boaz woke up at midnight to find a woman lying at his feet and proposing marriage. And so she says, I am Ruth, spread your wings over your servant, your redeemer. Wings, interesting, can also refer to the corners or the edges of a garment. Very interesting word uh, that is used here. And it is a marriage proposal. And she is proposing marriage to Boaz. And, and it was uh, kind of a scary thing. It's interesting, the word wings, back in chapter two again, Boaz had been speaking to Ruth and he had said, for what you have done, a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. And the word wings there is the same word wings here, And uh, so it's, or some translations pick the other way and go with the garment and and it could read either way. But I think, I think Ruth was doing a play on the word and she was hearkening back to his blessing on her. And basically she's saying, will you be the fulfillment of that blessing? Did you really mean what you said? Wow. (laughs) And so uh, she says, spread your wings over your servant. The the kinsman, the redeemer, the law of Moses required that when a man died childless, a close relative should marry the widow, thus perpetuating the family name and keeping the land in the family. So a widow would not marry outside of her tribe or clan, but to keep that, they had had the tribal allotments of land when they had come into the promised land. And so to keep that land within the tribal allotments, and so it didn't get all confused and passed over to other tribes, 
you were only to marry within the tribe. And so if you were widowed, someone then, a close relative, would marry and keep on going that family name and would also perpetuate then the ownership of the property within the tribe. And so that's what Ruth was proposing to Boaz. She's saying, you are a close relative. You are a potential redeemer, one who will marry me, perpetuate the family name that my husband, who was the son of Elimelech, he died, his brother died, his dad died. There was no one to carry on that family name. And so she was saying, you would carry on that family name and the property then would come under your ownership and you would take care. And, and so she was proposing that he be the redeemer. Well, one of the commentators talked about Boaz and Ruth as a couple. He said, they're totally different in just about every way. One grew up in idolatry and pagan religion. The other had grown up as a follower of the true God. He was rich, she was poor, lived hand to mouth. He was a business owner, she was a migrant worker. He was single, she who had been married and now widowed. And he was a mature believer and she was a brand new follower of the Lord. The list could go on and on and on. You know, if you go online now, a lot of people meet online anymore. Uh, we've known couples who met online and got married and had wonderful marriages. And so many people do, but they usually say, we're going to find you your compatible mate, someone who has all the same interests you do. Well, Boaz and Ruth didn't have a lot going on in that area. And, and it's interesting that you usually find when you marry somebody that they are really opposite you in so many ways, as it turns out down the road, you know. You don't think that going in, but it kind of turns out that way sometimes. So at any rate, but Davy goes on to say, but they had this in common, their commitment to the Lord, to Yahweh, and the genuine character that each had in following his leadership. They were both of high character, and they were both committed to following the Lord. And I think that is the truly significant compatibility factor. It, uh, I grew up hearing that you should not marry an unbeliever. And uh, I, I believe that yet. And so that I think was their prime compatibility. And so she proposes marriage and he responds. He said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first and that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You remember when Boaz first came into the book of Ruth, when he came to oversee his fields and he called out to his servants and he said, may the Lord be with you. And you know, what a wonderful blessing that he would give. It was his first words we meet him with was a blessing in the name of the Lord. And then he blessed Ruth in the name of the Lord. And now again, he's blessing Ruth in the name of the Lord. This is a trait of Boaz's, if you will. And, and I am so impressed that the first words he says to Ruth after her proposal is a blessing in the name of the Lord. And his last words to Ruth after that will be in the name of the Lord again. That, that it kind of sandwiches his comments. So he has a very integrated faith. That is, it's not something he puts on for Sabbath day or he puts on for uh, Shabbat or for services in the synagogue or wherever they would have gathered. It was just part of his life. It was the way he lived and who he was. And so he says, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter, a term of respect and compassion that they've been using for Ruth throughout. You have made this last kindness. There's that word kindness again. Do you remember how that verse we started with translated that word has said kindness? It was steadfast love. That is the 
covenant loyalty love that the Lord has for his people that he has promised to. And it was that kind of con covenant faithful love that you have shown. You had shown that love to Naomi when Ruth had committed to follow Naomi and she has been with Naomi and provided food for Naomi and cared for her through all these weeks and respected her. And, and he says, now this last kindness, this last loyal love you have shown to Naomi in that you could have gone after anybody. You've been working out with these young studs in the field and you could have seen somebody that caught your eye who looked pretty good out there. And he said, you haven't gone after any of them, whether they were poor or rich or whatever, but you have sought out a redeemer, someone who would honor your family, Naomi, and carry on the family name. And, and that honor and respect to the family heritage really touched Boaz. He liked the quality of this young lady. And so he compliments on this last kindness. So first was her faith, love, commitment, and the last was choosing a redeemer as a husband. And now he says, my daughter, do not fear. I will do all for you, all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. And again, some qualities of Boaz highlighted in the blue boxes. Uh, now, my daughter, do not fear. Uh, he understands how Ruth must have felt trying to make this proposal to him. And he is understanding her position and has compassion and says, don't fear. I want to marry you with everything that's in me. This is my desire as well. I will do all that you ask. It would be my privilege to be the redeemer, to marry you and to carry on your family name and so on. And so he is expressing his compassion, his understanding, and then making his commitment back to her. Yes, this is something I desire. Uh, and, you know, all my fellow townsmen have been talking about you. <laughs> Basically, that's what he's saying. But they all know that you are a worthy woman. The word worthy is a word we've run into before, too. I don't know if you remember talking about that word worthy, but uh, the word worthy woman, uh, we could translate it noble character. Some of the translations, uh, ESV here has worthy woman. It's one word, that word kayil. Uh, it could mean a woman of excellence. New American Standard uh, translates it that way. Also in Proverbs 12.4, Proverbs 12.4 is where it says, an excellent wife who can find. And that's the word that's used there, kayil, a woman of noble character. Or in Proverbs 31, the Proverbs 31 woman. And it says, you know, an, an excellent wife is her worth is far beyond jewels and so on. Or the NIV translates noble character. Or the New Living Translation, New King James or King James, all translate it virtuous woman. And so all of those uh, apply to uh, carrying out and explaining how Ruth is viewed among that people of that town. It's a small town, people talk, right? <laughs> if you come from a small town, you know, uh, because that's the way they are. So anyway, Boaz quickly assures her that he is ready and willing to marry her, and he and everyone sees her as a worthy woman, a woman of excellence, a woman of noble character. And, and so far from being some kind of a Moabite refugee that has come here and sponging off our stuff, uh, he says, no, you are a woman of noble character and uh, highly esteemed. And, and so what a balm that would be to Ruth. And, and then there is this statement of honesty 
but I warn you that I am a redeemer, but there is a closer relative who has first options. And uh, that must have been a little fearful, perhaps. I don't know if Ruth was aware of that. So why has Boaz been so slow to act? Did you ever wonder, you know, I mean, I'm sure Naomi wondered. Why, why doesn't he take action? Uh, not because he didn't want to marry her. He's made that clear. And it's not because she wasn't good enough. Perhaps he saw himself as old for her. He says, you haven't gone after some young person, whether poor or rich. And uh, perhaps because he didn't want to take advantage of her, because being a poor servant gleaning in the fields, it would have been easy to take her as a concubine or something else rather than wait for marriage. And because someone else had first rights. And so maybe he was wrestling. Maybe he had doubts. Maybe he wondered, will she even really want me? I'm an old guy, you know? And, and maybe he wondered whether he would be one she would choose. And, and so do you know how you, you get silly doubts and things rise in your mind and fears? And so they both could have struggled with that, but uh, it, it comes out beautiful. And so he says, remain tonight and in the morning. If he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. So she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognize another. And so quite, quite early dawn, uh, she arises so they make this promise before the Lord, and she lay at his feet until morning. She kept laying at his feet. Now, they are kind of engaged. A lot of couples would think, well, why don't you just go ahead and lay with him? I'm trying to speak carefully and lovingly, but it breaks my heart when I see senior adults who are engaging in behavior that they never would have allowed from their children. Folks, it still matters that we be pure and clean. And so they had proximity. They wanted to be together, but they kept it clean, purity, and maintained that proximity. And, and then when it got to be towards morning, she wakes up. Boaz is guarding against temptation in several ways as I look at it. His integrated faith, his conversation began and ended with reference to the Lord so that his faith kept him on target. He had previous interactions with Ruth had all been in public. He never took the opportunity to draw her away, but it was always in public in the field and so on. He was disciplined and engaged in work. He carried on his work, was a disciplined guy. Uh, he had purpose to protect her in his purity. He had taken and, and given orders to his young men, don't touch her. She is to be protected and cared for. And so he had watched over to protect her purity. And he avoided physical intimacy, even in this opportunity in the night with himself. So uh, I'm very pleased with him. The verse reference, Job 31.1, Job says, is he's defending himself to his accusers. He says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? He said, I have made a covenant, kind of a promise before the Lord that I will not look at a woman in a wrong way. I'm not going to allow my eyes to dwell on a woman's form and begin to imagine things. I will not allow that to happen. 
I have made a covenant with my eyes. Boy, this is very practical, men, to make a covenant with your eyes, not to... uh, I I had one pastor who spoke to us at a uh, men's group, and, and he said, it's a neck above covenant. Uh, I would not look neck below. And so uh, that was the way he worked that out. But Job goes on in the next verses to say, if I were to commit some kind of uh, an adultery, that would be a crime worthy, a sin worthy of everything that the Lord has done to me and more if I should have done that. But he says, I haven't. So uh, Job uh, made that important. And in the New Testament, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, Paul is writing to the young church at Thessalonica, and he says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, translated that you abstain from sexual immorality. This is the will of God for you, that you keep yourself pure before the Lord and before men. And so it was an important principle that was being practiced then and is true now in the New Testament church. So he says, remain tonight, and and then uh, she rose early in the morning. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. So evidently there were people there, his guys, his workers. And he said, don't let it be gone out that she was here I uh, want to protect your reputation, lest gossip start. And he said, bring the garment you were wearing, hold it out. And so this gift of love, if you will, he measured out six measures of barley and put that into her cloak. And uh, then she went back into the city. Uh, I don't know what kind of a, a, a gift uh, that you got for an engagement ring, but he gave her six measures of barley for their engagement and uh, kind of an unusual gift. And she went home, and she came to her mother-in-law, and she said, how did you fare, my daughter? (laughs) I imagine Naomi's been up all night wondering. And she told her all that the man had done for her. I think they talked for hours. At any rate, she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, these six measures of barley he gave to Marie, for he said to me, you may not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. So uh, all the ways that Boaz had shown his love for her, his character, his promise to be hers, his concern, his wording, his expressions, she would have told Naomi everything, blow by blow by second by second, and, and just had a wonderful, you know, conversation between the gals. Um, Perhaps you too are uh, in a position of, she replies, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. Once Boaz has this in mind, he is not going to rest. It'll be taken care of today. Just a little, do you know that chorus? Just a little longer, and the trump of God. I heard that chorus when I was reading that verse, and she's telling her daughter, wait just a little longer. It's going to be settled today. And uh, we come back to that verse we started with. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. So we are, in a sense, waiting for our Redeemer, Jesus said in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He is preparing a place for us in the Father's house. Uh, He is our redeemer. Our redemption is complete. He is the one and only redeemer who is qualified and able to pay for the sins of the whole world and to redeem us to the Father. And he has done so. He has paid for all our sins. And when we are trusting in Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are the redeemed, those who have been purchased back to him, and we are waiting for our groom to 
to return. For we are part of the church, the bride of Christ, and we're waiting for the groom to return and take us back to the Father's house. And it's a pretty exciting time, but it seems like it's been a long time, doesn't it? And uh, I wanted to share these last words from Jesus from Revelation 22. In verse 20, in 7, Jesus said, Behold, I am coming soon. In verse 10, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Shame on the people who avoid the book of Revelation because they can't understand it, and to them it's a closed book. Shame on them. The Lord said, do not seal this up. It is a message to the church. And he said, so don't seal up because the word time is near. And he said again, behold, I am coming soon. And then in verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. The book of Revelation is written for the churches. It's written for us. I, I hope you have gotten into the book. And then the, the last time he says in chapter 22, verse 20, Surely I am coming soon. Now, if you put it all that together, he says, I am coming soon for the time is near. I am coming soon for the churches. I am coming soon. What more can he say? The word behold, by the way, is an imperative. It's a command. It's not just a throwaway exclamation at the end of the phrase, like we kind of read it, like, oh, wow. He means focus on this. Hold on to this. Behold this promise. Focus on it. Don't forget it. Behold, I am coming soon for you. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the promise of your steadfast, faithful, covenant love to us as believers today. We do get tired of waiting. It seems long. We anticipate and look forward to your coming and the days seem to be growing evil and worse. And Lord, the times are seem very uh, in accordance with the prophecies of the New Testament. Lord, we look forward to your coming. We look forward to Jesus, our, our Redeemer, our Groom, coming for us uh, with the shout of the, the archangel and the trump of God. Lord, uh, we look forward to seeing our Savior. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.